However, this doesn't just apply to, say, a soccer riot. Such mob persuasion can be generated through simply shared cultural events. Remember September 11th? Talk about mass insanity. This event created an immediate crowd madness with fear and revenge. And it didn't take long for the U.S. government and other governments, in fact, to harness that madness and funnel support for draconian legislation and illegal invasions. However, this herd psychological tendency is not only very useful for implanting and guiding perceived issues of importance, it is also critical in setting rigid limits of debate, creating the tendency for those who begin to question beyond those limits to be ostracized and rejected by the herd itself. You know, if someone talks about a more equitable distribution of income in society. All the growth that has occurred in our country over the last decade or more has gone to the upper one, two percent. Fucking communists. If someone speculates about the obvious power manipulation and corruption. God damn it, I am so sick of these conspiracy theorists and their lies. The Federal Reserve does not collude for its own self-interest. And heaven forbid we get those do-gooders who want to actually apply modern scientific knowledge and improve society with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Feed, clothe, and house everybody on Earth with technology? Utopian jackasses. Remember, probably the greatest way to control human thought is to establish a deep fear of social rejection and associate that fear to culturally taboo subjects. So, that groundwork in motion, we now have to deal with the pesky problem that the public just might wise up enough and work to maneuver a person into political power that will cause us problems. Therefore, some more specific structural safeguards are in order. Basically, we need to make sure those unwanted candidates are unable to get anywhere near the major outlets for public digestion. And if they do, the practice is to treat them like freaks. Are you suggesting that heroin and prostitution are an exercise of liberty? What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? How do we do that? With money. And our corporate constituency has plenty. We just need to make sure the use of this money for political influence goes uninhibited. In a U.S. Supreme Court 1976 decision, the freedom for a candidate to use unlimited personal money for their campaign was deemed illegal, equating spending money with the right of free speech, in fact. What this translates to, in effect, is the removal of any regulated fairness of expression, and hence whoever has the most money has the most resources and hence effect. Perfect. However, let's secure this a little bit farther. Let's also make sure that our corporations are given the legal right to promote our little puppets without limit. Luckily, in 2010, our pals again at the U.S. Supreme Court confirmed that the government may not restrict political spending by any corporation in candidate elections as they are, once again, protected by the First Amendment. So now we can buy mad ad space to promote whoever we want as much as we want, drowning the opposition in the media. And double check. Okay. Now, those broad measures in place, it is still important to control the basic unfolding of the electoral process from start to finish. The best way to do this is to create a false duality, the illusion of competition between parties. We need a two-party system that constantly argues with each other in general, but still upholds the basic elitist policies we need to maintain our advantage. The beauty of this dominant two-party farce is that it not only gives the public the needed illusion of choice, it more importantly oppresses those upstart third parties. As we know, these annoying self-righteous third parties have been troublemakers from day one. The civil rights amendments, women's suffrage, broad worker rights, child labor laws, and other agitations for industry all came from these rising third parties historically not from the dominant established group, us. So we need to be vigilant here. We need to get the public so used to this two-party dictatorship that they don't even mind if the two parties are given direct control over most of the electoral process itself. They need to have the power of organizing the rules of electoral redistricting, the primaries, 
the caucuses and debates, and of course we, the ruling class, will moderate their actions through lobbying, campaign contributions, you know, exactly what the free market promises, the freedom to manipulate everything. So meet our friends, the Commission on Presidential Debates, or CPD. In 1988, the Democratic and Republican parties, or the Demopublicans as I like to call them, established the Commission on Presidential Debates. Posing as a nonpartisan institution, the CPD successfully took control of the most influential election event, the presidential debates. The CPD, which is a private corporation co-chaired by the former heads of the Republican and Democratic parties, decide through secret contracts who is going to participate in the debates and what is going to be talked about. So those pesky third parties, along with controversial ideas, can only come into play if the demo publicans decide they can. I mean, really, can you imagine what would happen if those annoying social upstarts actually were able to go up against the trite, miserable logic and narrow subject matter typical of our rigged debates? Hmm. But for the nurse, the teacher, the police officer, who, frankly, at the end of each month, they've got a little financial crisis going on. They're having to take out extra debt just to make their mortgage payments. Uh, we haven't been paying attention to them. And if you look at our tax policies, it's a classic example. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. President, but I couldn't agree more. However, don't you feel that the tax policies and other common acknowledgments about what is hurting the average American is actually quite benign when compared to the very foundation of our economic system? You know, making money out of debt, charging interest on it that doesn't exist, which means that there is always more outstanding debt than there is money to pay for it. Of course, that lends itself to more debt being created to cover it, and essentially failure and bankruptcy is inevitable. Not for the upper classes as much as the lower middle classes, of course. Why? Because the lower classes are the ones taking the loans for their home and their car, while the upper class are actually making interest income. Rather than paying interest, they actually make interest through their deposits and investments. Obviously, this secures a massive growing class divide structurally. Is that uh, not something worth considering? No? Oh, and as a final point about the CPD, our corporations can now directly donate to them, hence the parties, imposing our financial influence and hence agenda even more, making another end run around that pesky legal legislation barring corporations from contributing directly to political campaigns. A beautiful end run. Uh -huh. However, Nothing's perfect and you can't be too careful. And sometimes good old fashioned time tested tactics are needed. And nothing is as old fashioned as good old direct electoral fraud. So let's get some of our corporate buddies to build some voting machines with really terrible integrity and get them in as many critical spots as we can. Yeah, I know it's sloppy. It has already become public that the machines can be hacked remotely with about $10 in materials and an eighth grade science education. But since most Americans are completely distracted by their debt, lowering standard of living, and ongoing job losses, the liberal media falls on deaf ears. So, let's recap. Free-thinking people tend to recognize the need for ongoing adaptation and change. So we need to make sure education supports the existing tradition through mere rote learning not critical, logical thought. Next, we establish clear limits of debate in the culture and make sure those who go beyond the pale are shut down by endless ridicule and debasement. Then we need to harness the herd psychology and guide it through our media to either identify with the issues we need in the forefront or distract them outright. As far as large-scale influence, we need to have the freedom to do whatever we want and to use our vast corporate wealth to influence both public opinion and the candidates themselves. Our legal status as a corporate person now ensures our free speech and hence free spending. Next, we create the public illusion of competition and choice and gain as much control over the election process as possible. Our demo public in pawns with our endless sponsorship and lobbying, now handles this well. 
including the restriction of public debate and the denial of all interfering third parties. And if that wasn't enough, screw it. We'll just reorder the ballot counts ourselves with the black box voting hacks in the most influential electoral states. And so it goes. You know, since the beginning of civilization, those in power have successfully restricted the interests of the majority by regulating their values, by controlling resources through money, not to mention controlling the very processes that exist to challenge them. Is it a conspiracy? Do such powerful men meet in dark rooms and work to figure out how to keep their power? Actually, no, not as much as you might think. You see, the hilarious thing about all of this is that such a process of manipulation is actually self-generating, justified in a step-by-step -step manner with basic self-interest guiding the whole way. You see, the real corruption is not occurring in backroom meetings or at the docks. The real power resides in how you, the public, actually perpetuate, condone, and support the very underlying systems that oppress you. Final thoughts. Many watching this program's content will likely interpret the broad farce known as American democracy, or really the farce of global democracy, in fact, as a system in need of better regulation. The ACLU, Democracy Now!, Michael Moore, Occupy Wall Street, Annie Leonard, and other intelligent and outspoken activist institutions and figures seeking what they call change all actually operate within the same presupposition. If only we can better regulate monetary and corporate power, we can fix the world. No. I'm sorry to say that until the social premise itself, and hence the fundamental psychological drivers of our economy, imbalance, scarcity, narrow self-interest, exploitation and competition, until those are altered to the extent that the system begins to reward and reinforce collaboration, human and ecological balance, efficiency and sustainability, nothing is going to really change. In a sociological condition where everything is based on advantage over others, what we call corruption today isn't actually corruption at all. It's just business as usual. I mean, seriously, what did you people expect? In an economy where everything is for sale by the very ethic inherent, underscored by the false notion that we can't possibly work together intelligently to benefit all, no level of supposed corruption should surprise any of us. So, in short, to assume we're gonna perpetuate this economic philosophy here and then contradict it over here with the idea that certain elements of society should be off limits from monetary manipulation and gain is completely naive and absurd. But don't take my word for it. Just sit back and watch the ebb and flow as we move from one set of corrupt, damaging practices to the next. Sure, we'll slowly fix a few issues with our in-the-box thinking, but until the whole system is addressed at its core, unfortunately, it's all mostly a waste of time and improvement will be very, very little. And until we grow up to that level, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. And until next time, I'm Peter Joseph, an agent and victim of a culture in decline. Take. Not corporate tyranny.